not this year, but last year, my son got his first wearable for Christmas. It's what he really wanted. Um, I have one now, uh, because I follow my son's lead. Um, you know, I know a lot of people get them over black Friday and the holidays. This makes sense. What are we, you said there's some things we should pay attention to and some things we shouldn't. Yeah. So to your point, uh, just taking the accelerometer or the pedometer conversation a step further. Yeah. And there are biometrics that, you know, can really help you hone in on some behavioral aspects of your life can, you know, help you with other more serious clinical issues potentially. Sure. Uh, so it, we, we can certainly touch on all, you know, facets of where these might be useful, but in general, what we're looking at, um, you know, so how, how are these, what are these referred to? Uh, in the literature, yeah, you know, what, in many of the studies that we talk about, or at least one of the papers that we reference. Uh, so they are referred to as WBMDs. So wearable biometric monitoring devices. Okay. So that could be a watch. It could be a patch. For it most be people, a ring, it's a watch. It could be a Fitbit type thing. Right. For most people at this point, it is a watch. But the Whoop, for example, yep. doesn't have a screen. It, you know, it sits where a watch would sit or they have, you know, bicep bands and, you know, you can put a band around your thigh. Okay. So in general, again, like we're alluding to, they're used primarily in the context of health. Mm -hmm. And so that's aspects like biomedical research, clinical care, specifically personal health, which mm -hmm. I think a lot of this conversation will be centered around, uh, plus, you know, a million other things, but mm -hmm. those are kind of the big ones in the context of health some research, some, you know, personal care, some uh, clinical care. So between you and a physician or you and a provider. So for us, we're primarily talking about <clears throat> the personal and, and with a physician. I think so. Okay. Yeah. And so the function. So in one of the papers uh, that we are going to be referring to, it's by uh, Canali and colleagues. Uh, they broke it into four nice functional categories. So the first one is monitoring and so that would be things like pulse monitoring or advanced telemonitoring. So that's essentially like heart rate or rhythm or some sort of key cardiovascular parameter that's being shared directly with your provider. Okay. So that's more of a, you know, somebody's monitoring what's, what's happening physiologically with you, maybe from a distance. And theoretically, that would be in a case where there's a known mm -hmm. risk. Sure. I assume somebody who maybe had a heart attack. Mm hmm Okay. All right. That's not just everybody, big no. brothers watching your heart rate kind of thing. No, okay. but I'm sure that there's a lot of those. Yeah. There's a lot of those implications in general. Yeah. Pri the privacy privacy sure. is a huge concern with these. So yeah. The second aspect would be screening. Mm -hmm. So screening, monitoring sounds like the same thing. Screening is more like trying to find at what point somebody's over the threshold for some sort of disease state that we might care about. Right. So you're screening specifically for AFib, uh, you're screening specifically for sleep apnea. The, you know, there are companies that will send you a device to wear and based upon your oxygen saturation, mm -hmm. heart rate, your movement, it can, you know, detect a clinical or subclinical sleep apnea. Right. Uh, and then like we mentioned, cardiovascular disease as well. Detection. Um, it's funny, all these terms sound similar, Yeah, yeah. but to, to break them out helps a little bit. So detection, we're looking at simply physical activity levels. So you might notice that your watch detects from 1130 to 1215, your heart rate was higher and it noticed that maybe you were exercising or you were on a long walk. So it yep. picks up things like that. Um, it also can detect certain changes and certain parameters that would maybe indicate flu, maybe indicate some sort of respiratory effect, uh, infection, COVID. I know that was a big, yeah. I remember when I first got the whoop a while ago, that was the big thing is everybody was trying to find, everybody was trying to determine if they had COVID or is it, some, right. is it, should I test? The oxygen saturation really mattered. There it were was, oxygen saturation. They were looking at heart rate variability. They were looking at your resting heart rate. Um, but man, you, they're just, those, those sort of things can be non-specific. Yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. Not, not particularly sensitive to those illnesses. So, right. And so, as you can tell, we're alluding to some of the downsides with these. Right. They, there's certainly maybe an entry point, you know, if you're watching the trajectory of certain 
parameters, but it's not going to say boom, right. positive for X or Y. So <laughs> right, right. And then the final category is prediction. So looking at a lot of these same parameters that we're referring to, um, you know, if your heart rate is this, it's maybe predictive of this. Or if you wear your watch all the time or you have your phone on you all the time and you only manage to accumulate 2,500 steps a day, it's a, there, there can be maybe some sort of predictive uh, link yep. to uh, some other health condition. Yeah, obesity potential risks. Or yeah. Uh, cardiovascular disease. So uh, there, there's a, there is obviously a million and one roles for wearables. It's just, how are you using it individually? How are you using it with the, in tandem with a provider? Um, and so we can kind of hopefully square some of those circles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So that makes sense. I think most people are going to listen to that and go, yeah, right. I want to know where I'm at. And I, know, wanna know, I want to know what kind of progress I'm making. Mm -hmm. And these are useful for that in general. Mm -hmm. But there are all kinds of really fun outlier situations. Like you were saying, the, the screening where it can kind of find some things yeah. that you might not even notice yourself. Mm -hmm. Did yours, because you just had COVID, mm -hmm. did yours notice beforehand, before you felt it? I just don't use it. I don't use, so I don't, <laughs> you don't use look the, it closely enough. Right. I don't yeah. use the whoop anymore. Oh, okay. And so I don't get a, I don't, at least from what I know with Apple watches, I don't get a recovery score. I don't look oh. at, I don't really look at heart rate variability. All of the parameters that whoop would use to give you a recovery score. Okay. And so early on, you know, 2020, 2021, I would, you know, it would be a normal night of sleep. Mm-hmm generally felt fine. And I would wake up with a 32 out of a hundred recovery score. Oh, wow. And then you're like, that's weird. You're like, oh man, what's going could on? Could it be this, the C word? It could you be. Know? <laughs> <laughs> We've said it enough times. We can say it now. Show's so, going to get banned forever. So in, to your point, the same benefits for screening are also simultaneously drawbacks in the general population. Yeah. So it's, the, these are certainly not at the point where somebody in the, left to their own devices could dictate whether or not they need to. These are not a replacement for a doctor. There's so many, so many factors that go into your resting heart rate. Yeah. Heart rate variability. Yep. Your respiratory weight <clears throat> rate while you're sleeping that to, for you to make an educated guess. I mean, it just, it can point you in the direction of 10 things. Right. You know. Absolutely. So it's more about trajectory than mm -hmm. it is about a specific uh, moment, mm -hmm. necessarily. Okay. <laughs>